Yeah. yeah, no problem. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Crockcast Podcast. I'm your host, Nate, along with my co-host, Matt. Hey. And today we're joined by Mr. Frank Robb. Frank, welcome to the show. Howdy. Thanks, you all. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, uh, Frank, uh, you want to get us started on with uh, how you first got into reptiles and uh, kind of what what you do and what you have done throughout your career? Yeah, so uh, it was pretty early on. It was this or life in prison. And, uh, you know, the judge doesn't give you another chance. You kind of roll with what you have. And uh, in all seriousness, uh, I started catching uh, – alligators with my uncle who was uh working for then game and fish uh 27 years ago here in florida as a as a freshman in high school and uh never imagined it to be a career i kind of went with it from that point on and uh whenever he retired in the early 2000s uh, I, I kept after it and kept going with uh with fwc and it's been involved in kind of every every kind of study you can possibly imagine with uh with american alligators uh, radio tracking, endocrinology, toxology, uh, you, you name it. I've done a little bit of all of it. And, you know, been lucky enough now, blessed enough to be able to do that up in North Carolina, do that through my own nonprofit that I started, and uh, do that down in Belize with American Crocs, too. Uh, so that nonprofit, uh, that would be uh, EARS, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. It's uh, uh, E E A R S S dot org. Yeah. And, uh, you want to go over what uh, your nonprofit does? Yeah, so we do we do pretty much uh, endocrinology and toxicology research here on the Space Coast with uh, American alligators around the whole uh, NASA area. We're about I live about five minutes off the Kennedy Space Center, so uh, yeah, I still catch I still catch alligators for them for NASA and for DoD, and uh, we've been doing research out there for quite a long time um, that has just kind of ended here recently, but. Uh, also do biodiversity research across, again, the Space Coast here where I'm at, where we look at different species, uh, you know, herps, uh, whatever it might be, traveling back and forth between different habitat types and allow the, the county to update their land management plans based on what they have. My, my every day is pretty different. Is, do you, uh, does your research at all look into, like, how, um, like, the, the space centers and everything are affecting the crocodiles that live around there, or is, or is it? Yeah, so, you know, we use the American alligators as a sentinel species for human health. Their endocrine system and ours, and the, their endocrine system and hormones are like a 99% match for ours. And then being an apex predator and eating everything in the environment below them, they're basically a floating file of information kind of holding uh, the key to all the toxicity, the, the, the toxic things in the area, every methyl ethyl bad thing that's going on. And we take blood tissue and urine and analyze that and look at what, what's happening around us because the stuff that's affecting them will be affecting us. Interesting. So have you found any results that you can talk about that are of concern or, or of, of talking points at all? Yeah, we've published a lot of stuff over the years. Uh, it's been published by one of my other board members, uh, a fellow named uh, Russell Lowers. He's, he's published a lot of things. Um, I've been part of those studies, never been, never been any of the stuff that's been published, but uh, never been, never been a co-author on it per se, but been part of those studies. But uh, yeah, there's a lot there to read about, uh, a lot of stuff going on. We live in a very industrial area over here on the Space Coast, so there's a, a lot of issues with the Indian River Lagoon. You know, we might hear about that mm -hmm. quite a bit, yeah. that area. Um, a yeah, yeah. lot, lot of different things going on, and yeah, we're dealing with uh, manatee deaths and uh, seagrass going away and a, a lot of things happening. And there's a there's many reasons behind that, uh, more than just you know industrial areas, but it, it's uh, kind of looking at the multi multifaceted face of all that and trying to break it down into hey these are these are the contaminants that are the issues. Now let's figure out where we go from there. Um, are you looking into water quality a lot, or are you looking more into just like? the health of the gator and kind of inferring from there like do you ever do like water quality studies or anything like in tandem with it uh there's a group here uh called fight for zero brevard that does that specifically uh okay. that we you know we're we enjoy working alongside of them you know we try to highlight them when they're doing that kind of stuff but we're specifically looking at more of the apex predator and using that as a sentinel species for human health i mean they truly are the, they're, the, they're the canary that's there for that's us to look, to look at um now, along with uh, ears and your previous work with uh, 
FWC. You also do it looks like you do some uh, work with uh, St. Augustine a little bit here and there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I've uh, uh, been studying vocalizations for quite a long time uh, with all the different crocodilian species, and it's pretty neat that they have every species of crocodilian in one spot there at St. Augustine. So we'll go up there and we'll do recordings of uh, adults, juveniles, and hatchlings, and take that back to the lab and analyze it and see see what's going on with those things, different frequencies and what's coming here from where. And I always had a goal to be able to speak every species of crocodilian, which, I mean, it's a weird thing to say, but uh, it's part it's part of what I do. And uh, speaking of the animals at St. Augustine, there's one in particular gator there that you're kind of uh, famous for. Yeah, uh, old, old Chance. Yeah, Chance is up there. That was uh, quite the story. It, it seems to continue and continue to bless me over and over again to the point where I probably wouldn't be here right now otherwise. Uh, yeah, I guess that was 2019, July of 2019. The city of Chicago called me up there to catch an alligator. Uh, went up there to help out a critter, uh, just not trying to do anything other than that. And uh, yeah, it's kind of, it's worked itself into uh, some pretty amazing stuff. You know, I had to have open heart surgery, what, last March and didn't have any health insurance and went to that and the, the city of Chicago and a bunch of, you know, bunch of fans up there, which is weird to say, uh, raise the money and help me pay that bill off. So it's uh, pretty incredible stuff. It's way above my pay grade, you know what I mean? It's uh, That's something a lot higher than me working. And yeah, it's, uh, I try to always remain humble and be honest with myself because I, I ain't that special. I'm just a guy that's really good at a weird job. Um, <laughs> and you know, the good Lord puts you in the spots you need to be in, without a doubt. So um, when it came to catching a chance, was that a particularly interesting story at all? Or is it just like another random gator catch? No, it was, uh, yeah, it was pretty epic. Uh, yeah, I got a, got a call early one morning about a, I'd been watching on the news, you know, been seeing it and kind of just shaking my head. Like that's wow. They, they're really confused about what's going on up there. This is very different. And, you know, so if to, to give some background to that, um, I'm a, I'm a member of the crocodile specialist group and I'm a member of the human crocodile conflict group for them. So when things like this happen, uh, wherever it might be, we kind of give them some insight on how to look into this because there's not many people that have been doing uh, this type of work for any amount of time. There's only a handful of us around the world, you know, that kind of ha have an idea of what's happening. And, you know, they, they reached out to me. Actually, they reached out to the state of Florida. They reached out to St. Augustine, and they all dropped my name and said, hey, you want the guy. Here's the longest tenured guy doing it in the state of Florida, and he's pretty good at what he does. This is probably the guy you want, you know. Went up there, uh, it was about the craziest thing I think I've ever walked into. It was uh, a park uh, called Humboldt Park Lagoon. And I pulled up there, there were thousands of people there looking for this alligator, you know, dozens of news crews, helicopters buzzing around, uh, a mariachi band playing, food trucks, uh, people selling merchandise and buttons oh and shirts. And I, you know, I talked to him before I got up there, I said, I please have the park closed when I get there and I can get right to work and, and get this done. <laughs> and I remember being, when they drove me up there, I kind of went, what is this guys? <laughs> like this is, this is not going to work to see, you know, there's no way this works and ends up in me getting an alligator out of here. It's not how this, not how this, not how this happens. So they, uh, they shut the place down, um, was able to get in there the next night and, uh, find him and, yeah, it's kind of all been history from there. It's like I said, it's been blessing after blessing. Uh, the Cubs blessed me enough to let me throw out a first pitch at a Cubs game. I just told them it's like three o'clock in the morning. I wanted, I sold it. I would like to go to Wrigley Field and see a Cubs game while I'm in town. That's all I asked for. And next thing I know, they have me throwing out a first pitch, and uh, it's awesome. Yeah, that went and turned into a, a a Frank Rob bobblehead. Yeah, which is pretty bizarre. That was a very weird call too. We, uh, this is the National Bobblehead Hall of Fame. We'd like to make a bobblehead of you. I said, bobbleheads ain't things you hear about in the South. You know what I mean? So I'm like, what's, what's a bobblehead? I'm like, what are you talking about right now? What are we, what are, what are we talking about? Oh, a, fig, a figurine that bobbles. Okay. All right. I got you. Okay. I'm a walking bobblehead anyhow, so it's all good. But uh, yeah, it's, a, yeah, it's a, <laughs> just, it's been, it's been blessing after blessing, truly. I think I've been up there probably, probably about 20 times since then for different events. I go up there and do uh, do events for Chicago Animal Care and Control. I've done events for uh, 
uh, Joel Murray, uh, Bill Murray's brother, you know, they, they have, he holds a golf tournament up there for first responders every year that I go up there for. And it's just a lot of blessings, truly, a lot more than me. And uh, speaking of uh, blessings, now you've made some big time skill talk on our podcast to all 40 of our listeners. <laughs> hey, it's uh, as soon as I saw it was the Crotcast podcast, I'm like, this is the coolest thing ever. I'm like, the logo, <laughs> all of it. I'm like, this is jam up. I'm like, I got to talk to these guys. This is some, this is some cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, awesome. I was sold right off the bat. Yeah. Take <laughs> there you go. Well, you can give uh, credit to that to Nate. He's the one that came up the name. So. Oh, it was, it's bad of the bone. Yeah, all of it. Yeah, the, the crocodile talking on the microphone, all of it. It's, that's that's the, co- the coolest thing ever. <laughs> when, he, um, when he first approached me with the idea, he's like, hey, you want to do like a reptile podcast? And I already have the name, the Crocast podcast. <laughs> so there you go. Let's do it. <laughs> that's an that's a easy win. That is an easy, easy win. <laughs> thing is, I got crap. I got flack from my cousin over it. He's like, Hey Nate, why do you need to call it the Croc Talk podcast? It's like I don't know. It just said, "Hey, take this." It doesn't have the same. It doesn't work the same way. I don't think. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't doesn't have the same feel to it. Yeah. yeah, he just handed me a sticky note with a big L on it. Said, "Here, you take that L." I was like, <laughs> "Wow." I don't know. I mean, I got I got him, so I think it's working. I think count that as yeah. <laughs> um, funny stuff. Well, do you want to go um, into, just for like some of the listeners that aren't as aware, do you want to kind of go more into detail of the endocrine system and like why why that's a good sentinel system for humans um, and just kind of into, you don't have to go into like a ton of detail, but into more detail of why that, why that works and stuff? Yeah, so, you know, your endocrine system is part of what keeps you healthy, right, the, the, to break it down easily. Um, that's your, your liver, your prostate, your, your kidneys, all the all the, your thyroid, all the important parts of your body. And those hormones that run that system are the same as they are in the American alligator. And looking at that and how easy it is for chromosomes and things to be broken in our body. And because if you're looking at it, I guess, uh, real in depth, but but a simple way of thinking about it, there's only a certain amount of something, you know, whatever it might be. Let's say it's moon dust. Let's use something for, for instance. And you're exposed to a certain amount. There's a certain amount where your body kind of goes, okay, that's too much. And a chromosome breaks or whatever it is might happen. There's a mutation and things change. And crocodilians, that takes a lot to get them there. And they've got to the point where they can actually, they can repair their own chromosomes. Some pretty crazy stuff. Um, so they don't really get cancer. They don't really get sick. When we're, when we're looking at their endocrine system and these things, they can add up to a higher level in them than it would in us. So that's kind of, I mean, if that makes any sense at all, but uh, they're just, they're the perfect species. And we're seeing too, uh, you know, in crocodilians, it's uh, temperature that determines sex. Right. That is, that is the case, you know, in, in, uh, in every instance, unless there's environmental contaminants. And then those environmental contaminants actually will determine sex over that. So there's all kinds of these outside factors we're looking at through the endocrine system that will be affecting us. Uh, it, there's just, there's so many different pieces. There's so many different slices of that puzzle to look at. I mean, you, you, I can go on for forever about it. How are the, how, how are the, the contaminants changing the sex? Like, is it, how's that, how's that working? <laughs> it's, it's, it's overriding the system. So it actually, it grabs those hormones and changes them. And it takes, oh. they take control. Is that it's like, similar, like an override? Is that similar to, um, oh, what is it? Um, it, I don't think it's chytrid fungus, but there's something in it's, there's something in the water systems that will turn male frogs into female frogs. Is that, is it at all similar? I'm not sure. I, mean, I haven't heard of that before. Okay. Um, yeah. I saw that a long time ago when I was a kid. So I, I don't. I, I don't. You talk about Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> no, is, I, I saw that on a documentary a long time ago when I was a kid. I thought that was interesting, but it, it made me think of that. So, um, yeah, it's one of the arguments to you know what happened to the dinosaurs. Everything got warmer. Uh, sex all went a certain way. Well, that the same thing can happen with the contaminants. You know, contaminants can if they're de- determining sex of whatever the animal is. You or if that got to the point where it was doing that with us, then you could have all females, all males. And that's the end of the that's the end of the species. 
you know, I always, you, my joke's always been that the dinosaurs aren't here anymore because alligators ate them all, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> Have you found a good correlation um, or a consistent correlation between like X number of specific contaminant in alligator and then when you start to see that effects in human populations? Well, there's already a lot of stuff going on. Uh, again, over here where we're at in the Space Coast, there's uh, a lot of issues with heavy metal contaminants and uh, for forever chemicals. So we know that we know those issues are already here. Uh, where it, when you look at them out in the wild in an apex predator, you kind of get a better idea of what's going on. Because again, our area is very different over here. It's it's a lot of open water, and these animals aren't just staying in one spot. They're traveling large. I mean, we're seeing some that tra travel 40 or 50 miles from their starting point, which that goes against everything you ever learn about the American alligator that says they stay in a at the max a mile and a half radius. Over here, it's very different because you have all this open salt water and these freshwater outfalls are coming and going from. So it, it kind of it mixes everything up a little bit. So you got to really have a, a large study going on before you can kind of narrow exact exact things down and kind of put that all into a little box. Okay. So, you, okay. Um, now, is there uh, any, so you mentioned like they don't really get cancer at all, which um, I never really thought about, but that's pretty interesting. Are there any, since their endocrine so similar to, system is so similar to ours, have you, um, are there any applications to humans at all? Or Dr. John Wise at the University of Kentucky is working on all that stuff. Uh, we're, we're working with him. He's looking at, uh, he's looking at the, the fact how they can, re you know, repair their own chromosomes. The fact that, uh, I think Mark Merchant down in Louisiana is looking at this too, but uh, their blood kills every known virus and bacteria known to man on contact. So there's a lot of different, a lot of different ways to look at. There's so many. Yeah. There's so much we don't know at this point. You know, really, people have just started working with crocodilians. There's about this much known in an entire room. So yeah. a lot of these questions you're asking, some of that stuff's being worked on, but the answers just aren't really there yet. Yeah, that's super interesting. That's exciting though that it's you know there's all these possibilities. It's just such a wide field it's of really, research to look into. I mean, blood clotting alone. If you think about the way their blood clots, science still cannot explain that. There's, there's no, there's still no way to really explain how that all works. I mean, it just, even the, the things that you think it would have answers to, like, you know, the vocalization studies, these things have never, there's a couple species like the black caiman and uh, the American alligator and the, the American crocodile have been recorded, but the rest of them never even been recorded before. It's something that nobody else is even working on. How, um, how long or what's the, like the max duration a gator could be in salt water before it? It so it, it does take a huge toll on their body. Uh, traditionally, what we see down <clears throat> down here, they'll go out into the salt water over over the the course of a day. They'll go out there and they'll fish and they'll hunt, and then they they'll go back. They'll fish uh, and hunt in the salt water. Oh yeah, they love sharks. They love horseshoe crabs. They love stingrays. They'll find wow. big schools of mullet, and they'll go hit the big schools of mullet and fish out, fish them. Uh, Redfish. Super interesting. Oh yeah, they're 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 great at fishing. You see, we see them on the beach quite a bit too. Um, it's pretty cool I to watch them get surf. Yeah, it's pr pretty neat. But yeah, I, usually a, usually a day or two, and they have to be able to get back to that fresh water to drink a bunch and purge it all out. It does it it really does tax their system. That's one yeah. one of the th one of the huge things they deal with down here. So when they're eating in the water like i know they can close their throat to prevent water from going in but do they have any kind of mechanism to osmo regulate it all if they're spending an entire day eating it all in the water okay say that so one more time is there like if they're spending an entire day eating and i, I know they can close their throat to prevent water from going down but do they yeah, have any valve, right? say it again yeah we, with a throat valve right yeah they're right, right. Honest, right yeah do they have do they have um, any way they can osmo regulate it all? Like, because that seems pretty impressive to not be able to osmo regulate, but be able to spend an entire day eating in the salt water. Yeah, they just they hang out there, and the, the way that the way they have around that is they have these culverts or freshwater outfalls and ponds. And as soon as they get done doing what they do, because again, other crocodilians have those salt excretion glands, they don't. Right. So they just immediately jump back into the water and they drink a bunch of water and pee all that out mm. as quick as they can. Oh, that makes okay. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. also, the way alligators eat, they always have to swallow with their heads out of the water. Otherwise, they have to lower that valve and all the water go in their lungs. 
You'd be shocked, buddy. They eat underwater all the time. Really? Oh yeah. Yeah. I've seen them eat underwater all the time. Yeah, they they work it out. We I used to there used to be a guy with fish and wildlife that used to make that argument that there's alligators can't eat underwater. They can't bite anything underwater. They can't do underwater. Well, I, I, well they I they hundred percent can. Time, but... yeah. They'll swallow stuff with water. You'll see them mix it with water, and you'll see them go underwater and swallow things sometimes too. Huh. Yeah. It, every time, literally every time I think I know what's going on and I know a little bit, I see something like that and I go, okay, I've never seen that before. That's something new. Uh, write that down in the book somewhere. You know what I mean? That's That's pretty bizarre. Well, I was actually going to talk about this at the end, but it kind of relates to this, and I, I think this is pretty interesting. Um, so I I do kayak tours out in this brack. It's brackish water, but it's really really it's really salty. It's right next to the Gulf, and okay. um, um, and I was out with a tour, and I found a Burmese python, and we ended up it was like a three foot Burmese python. We ended up taking out super super docile, but I was super surprised. I like because the I, the man it's a mangrove estuary. And there's no, um, they completely flood at high tide. So there's, the only mammals that are out there are raccoons. So like, there's there's nothing really I could feed on. There's not really any fresh water out there. So I, I was like super surprised it was out there. My guess, it was probably dehydrated because it didn't really move at all um, when I grabbed it. It kind of like squirmed a little bit, but it didn't really move at all when I grabbed it. So I don't know if it was dehydrated or just super docile one but anyways i thought that was super interesting that i found a, a burmese python just out in like super salty water though but you know like i said every time you think you've seen it all you know what i mean or you've seen a little bit something like that throws you a curveball and you realize okay i really don't know that much you know we're, <laughs> I, we're constantly picking it up and again you're going to put that in the back of your brain and kind of go okay i've seen that before that's weird but i'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remember that for next time i told I told my people, I said, yeah, there, there's no fences in nature. <laughs> but the, it was funny because it was actually people that were renting um, for a different company that saw it and came back and told me and another guy who's big into herpetology. And we told them, no, you probably didn't see a Burmese pot. And we're like, no. Nah, yeah, and then they showed us a picture of it. And we're like, holy cow, it is a Burmese pot. So we went out there and grabbed it but um, and gave it to yes. FBC. So. But, That's an interesting talk of that alone with the whole uh, exotic and invasive species thing. Yeah, it was it was ba- all this stuff was bound to happen with the pet trades and you know people moving back and forth and going places. The, these things are here to stay. Uh, people need to get used to it because it, it ain't changing. You know, I mean, up right here where we're at, we have velt chameleons and uh, night anoles and I mean, you you name the animal, it's uh, they're 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 everywhere now. Uh, they're, and they're not going anywhere. Oh yeah, I in large number, large numbers. Yeah, every time. Well, every time you hear about the the field chameleons, you always hear Fort Myers and um, like Miami. Like so. That's yeah, those are the those are the ones they have. Uh, what on iNaturalist and stuff? You know, what I mean, they that they yeah. posted places, but they're they're all over the place. Um, Interesting. Yeah, it's it's again, it, they're here to stay. Yeah. People need to get used to it. Uh, nature, nature will balance itself out. Something will make it, something won't make it, and we'll move on to the next spot. You know, it's uh, the invasive and exotic thing. It just, it, it continues to kind of just make me shake my head. You know, I just, if if it was handled differently from the very beginning, we'd probably have a whole different conversation going on. But it wasn't, and things are where they're at now. So we just gotta kind of get used to it. Yeah. It- what are your, if you don't mind talking about it, what are your thoughts on them banning Burmese pythons on all these other things um, as pets? Burmese pythons and the other pythons. I think it's way too late. Um, <laughs> I think it's way too late. They're here, like I said, they're here to stay. The, the, that's uh, taking away the right for people to own an animal is not going to solve the, solve the issue at this point. It's, it's way past that. That's been the response I've heard from a lot of people is, uh, closing the barn door after everything is escaped, type of. Yep, it's uh, it's way too it's way too late. Now. It's way too far down the line now. At this point, that ship has come and went. It's and it's here to stay. It's in it's important. It ain't going nowhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always thought it'd be interesting, like somehow flash forward five hundred or five thousand years, just see what the ecology of South Florida will look like after everything's adapted to each other, so to speak. All this stuff is eventually going to be everywhere. You know, all these things that can survive in subtropical climates, 
they're all it's all going to be everywhere people need to get used to it it's not it's what we have here is going to be somewhere else what they have there is going to be here it's all going to all these subtropical climates are going to have the same things eventually i believe so, i heard this one guy recently i've never heard this argument said before and i heard him say this and i thought it was super interesting so i'm curious what your thoughts are he said um uh he so he basically said that um something that's considered an invasive species is something after the colonial period because you know like horses and, and and stuff were brought over by the colonials and stuff so he said anything that's invasive is, was brought after the colonials and so he said if you go and you care about you say we should get rid of x plant on hawaii he used the example of hawaii he said you should get rid of x plant on hawaii because it's going to endanger these three birds and he said well you can hit what his words were you can that's fine you can care about those three birds but there's no scientific argument as to why you should care about those birds over the invasive plant you just care about those birds more and he said that's fine but you have to admit that you it, the only reason is because you care about those birds more because he said everything can go anywhere at any time and things have been all of it basically kind, kind of what you said is basically everything can almost be anywhere at any time anyways things are always moving around like nothing's yeah, it, in its original spot so I, my, the issue I normally have is the issue with the term invasive and the term exotic. Uh, yep. These things, just because they're an exotic animal doesn't make them invasive, uh, but somehow that always goes hand in hand. Uh, it, it, just, it all gets very confused. And really, if they're here and they have a, a population that is uh, enthralled in an area that is, that is there and not going anywhere, they're no longer an exotic. They're they're part of they're part of what we have here they're part of the ecosystem it's time to just admit it it's like cuban tree frogs or anything else they ain't going nowhere you know uh you you can go down the line with all these species there's no reason to be sticking them in your freezer and freezing them uh there's no reason to be uh doing all the doing there's no reason to be killing them because they're not going anywhere just it, understand they're here to stay appreciate them for what they are and move on it's absurd how many cuban tree frogs there are like like i mean seriously like catching one and put it in your fridge like that is not gonna do a darn thing i when i go herping it's impossible like to walk through and not step on one like there's so many like i i, I avoid stepping on them, but like what i'm saying is like there's so many of them it's 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 not even funny like how many there are and so like i mean exactly what you're saying like oh i see what i'm gonna catch it and kill it it's like what is that going to do? <laughs> like, there's, there's a that's, billion of them in one little spot. <laughs> and that seems to be the answer for a lot of these different groups with these exotic species. And again, they're they're here. They have populations that are here that obviously aren't going anywhere. Yeah. It's time to it's time to find another answer. Learn learn to deal with it, or you know, understand maybe something positive they're bringing to the to the ecosystem as well. And instead of look at the negative side of it find out what they can do for you and, and move on, you know? It's kind of like grass carp, how those are considered, they're not considered invasive, they're considered non-native because they're right. good, they control plant populations in the in the canals, so. It's, it's whoever's <laughs> terminology they want to use, you know what I mean? Exotic, yeah, invasive, yeah. uh, non-native. It is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, that, it, it rubs my fur the wrong direction, you know what I mean? It just, it, I was having this conversation with, uh, my uncle, the guy I learned the trade from, and George Van Horn over at the Serpentarium in St. Cloud, it runs Reptile World Serpentarium. Yeah. And George has a very George is a legend. You know, he learned from Bill Haas to the Miami Serpentarium. Uh, that's where he got his start. Uh, another legend of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. George is a dear a dear friend of ours, and he had a a very inter interesting take on it that wasn't really any different from what you were comparing the guy to the, the Hawaii story from. It's like they're they're here. They're not going anywhere. Stop using the term invasive and exotic, and understand they're they're here, and, yeah. and they're not going. They're they're not. It's not going to change. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, in your research, have you ever had any encounters, or have you ever done any research with any of the uh, non-native species that are down down there? Yeah, I helped a lady from uh, a graduate student from. South Carolina do some research on Cuban tree frogs. Um, they didn't have a whole, they had, they had them up there, of course, but not like we have them down here. So she came down, they were looking at different, uh, 
viruses that were living under their skin. That was some pretty neat stuff. Uh, some some really neat stuff. The common cold and some other stuff that lived underneath their skin. Pretty neat. But that's uh, other other invasive. Not that I can really think of. Um, I mean, I've caught plenty of stuff, but it's usually just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, also, on a side note, it's kind of interesting how a lot of these like uh, Caribbean species, when they seem to get established, they seem to really spread way out outside of South Florida and across large parts of, like the Southeast. It's almost like they're like genetically built to handle uh, cooler climates than their home range almost. It just, you know, again, we think we know what they're, we think we know what they can handle because of where they're from. It's like the veils, you know, the veils are, they're north of Orlando now. They're, they're, they're up there. That's insane. Uh, but think about where they're from. They're a desert animal, right? I mean, they're used to, they're used to cold nights. They can find a little subtropical climate somewhere. A little, you know, little uh, warm spot within all the cool spots. They're set. Yeah. And once those things make it to an area, you're not getting rid of them either. And uh, I mean, what are they doing wrong? Eating besides eating their body weight in insects? Who cares? Right. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, I mean, I'm so, I shouldn't say who cares. The person who loves butterflies probably cares. Yeah. And I and I respect your butterflies, but uh, they're they're. I don't know. It is what it is. That's what annoys me the most, though, about the whole invasive, exotic, non-native thing is i don't want to say the word hypocrisy but like just how they care about the the flashier things they care about the burmese pythons but they don't care about you know the feral cats or you know or, or my biggest issue with it is my biggest issue of all the issues is when you have a lot of these exotics People are going out in the wild and catching them and taking them and selling them back to pet stores. Yeah. The whole problem started at the freaking pet store. So why are we allowing people to take them and put them back in the pet store again? It's ridiculous. You know, if the problem started at the pet store, don't go back there again. Don't allow people to bring them back and do that again. I mean, either you leave them where they're at or, you know, you, I don't know. The whole thing's just silly. There's so, there's so many problems with the whole, the whole concept. But again, I'm not the, I'm not the expert. I'm just a guy that likes alligators. <laughs> I'm the I'm the crocodilian biologist. I shouldn't be talking about things that are above my pay grade. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm allowed to have an opinion, and that's definitely that's definitely my opinion. When people are going out and catching these things, catching toke geckos or whatever it might be, and taking them and reselling them back to a pet store, you shouldn't have caught it in the first place. You know why? Why? It happens a lot with the chameleons. That's it does. Super, yeah, that's the whole that's reason the chameleons are there. People purposely establish them for farming. Yeah, it seems to be that them. way. Yeah, it's very sad. Such a get, such a cool critter. I live over in Fort Myers, and okay. um, Labelle, you know, Labelle's right across from there. And from all the things that I've seen and stuff, they said if you go, apparently Labelle has a few, a lot of field chameleons. But if you go over there, you're likely to get shot. <laughs> <laughs> looking for them so they're like a lot of people don't care for you shining flashlights toward their house yes yeah, so most people don't care a whole lot for that yeah <laughs> they're like yeah they're like labelle has the is the best spot to look for them down here but it's the least safe place to look for them <laughs> that's crazy yeah that's yeah. crazy uh so you also recently started up. Well, I don't know how recently, but you started uh, your own podcast, the uh, Ears Podcast. You want to go into that and talk about that a bit? Yeah, so uh, I started a, a podcast with a local high school, actually a high school I went to, uh, as a way for the kids to be part of producing a live show. Uh, you know, they do all the sound editing and the video editing and kind of produce the whole thing. And uh, I bring in different, try to bring in different people, uh, groups, or organizations that are making a difference around the world not you know not just here in our community but we've had some we've had some fun ones too we had uh frank schwindel from the cubs plays first base for the cubs we've had uh george went on here recently norm from cheers and uh you know some national talk show hosts and it's been been a lot of blessings just uh trying to help these kids you know with their, their next step whatever that might be and kind of give them some focus and something fun for the local community as well um so what got, you, what got you interested in the whole endocrine system of of uh 
alligators and stuff. Like, what what got you into that aspect of alligators? That was all my my uh, my buddy Russ. That was his. That's his baby that was out there on the space center. Um, that was actually started by him and a a, a doctor Lou Gillette back in the day. And when I first met, the, I was actually at a place uh, over on Merritt Island off the Kennedy Space Center. And I was catching this big 10 foot alligator in a parking lot. And when I'm catching him, I'm looking at his, his uh, scoots in the back of his neck, his bucklers, and there's zip ties going through his scoots. And I'm going, well, what is going on here? Um, something interesting is happening here. Somebody apparently is working with alligators around here that I, I don't know about, and I, I need to find out what's going on. And that was one they had a transmitter on uh, previously. You know, I reached out to U.S. Fish and Wildlife there on the on the Maryland National Wildlife Refuge, and they hooked me up with uh, you know them th that were doing that research, and we've kind of been buddies ever since. That's that's how my interest started. Uh, awesome. Lou Gillette was Lou Gillette and Russ both were uh, their Lou's past. Um, he that was uh, Russ's mentor, but the guy was like a. Uh, he was, a, he was a teacher, you know, at, at University of Florida and at uh, University of South Carolina. And if you were around the guy, you couldn't help but to learn things. He was one of those guys that was consistently always teaching. And uh, that's that's where my interest started. And I went back to school at that point and got my biomedical degree, and all to be able to look further into this kind of stuff and, and go somewhere with it. That's awesome. Have you done any work with the Crocs down in the East Coast? American Crocs? Uh, no, I've called... I've caught one up here. Actually, we had the furthest north one ever to be spotted. Um, I caught up here at the Cocoa Beach Pier. It was in, in a surf at the pier. Uh, that was pretty neat. That was 2009, I want to say. Um, but, you know, down in South Florida, I haven't. I plan on getting down there probably late July and uh, doing some work with the guys down there. That's the, that's the plan as of right now. We haven't put a date in motion, but I'll be down there in, in late July, it looks like. But I, you know, we do do that. We do the same research in Belize with uh, uh, Dr. Teas. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. So what? What? Um, is your work down in Belize pretty much the same stuff you're doing over there? Is it over here, or is it a little different? Yes, yeah, exactly the same. Well, they do some extra stuff too. Heck, Marissa does all kinds of stuff. You should have her on your podcast. Uh, yeah, you she does. Twice. Oh, have you? Marissa's yeah. one of my best buddies. Uh, she went to Chicago with me time before last uh, up there. She's a she's an absolute blast, a, a dear friend and a, a great lady and a flipping genius. Uh, really, the woman's brain is so big it's terrifying. But <laughs> if watching her work, hanging out with her and watching her work is truly inspiring. inspiring. Yeah, yeah, the lady, lady does, does, does everything, everything, everything at once. It seems like. But uh, yeah, it's uh, she does she does she does everything down there. Yeah, like like Matt said, we had her on twice. First time we we're you know talk about her uh, the CRC and all the work we do doing just down there. Uh, but then later, like a few months later, I realized, oh crap, we forgot to talk about her big thing with parasites. So we had to have her back on to talk about oh, yeah. parasite research, which was pretty fun. She she starts getting to parasites and you kind of go, wow, uh, there's so much information here. I don't know where to go with it. Um, it's... <laughs> It almost gets spooky. It's like a weird. It's like a weird conspiracy theory about some of this stuff, and then you start looking it up, and you're like, "Wow, this is some this is some crazy stuff. Uh, some really neat, some really neat stuff." Let's see um, That's how I feel like when I when I do these kayak tours, I'll talk about because I talk about red tide, and it's it comes from the dust that blows over with the Sahara wind, which also carries over the the diatoms, which feed the ph the phytoplankton that bring give oxygen to the world, so I always like to explain how that's where oxygen comes from and not from trees. And people all the time think I'm talking sort of conspiracy conspiracy theory in that, and they're like, they're like, what? Like one one lady did not believe me. We had to we had to after the thing go and like she had to Google it and stuff and look it up and find out that it it's not from trees and stuff. And she, she just like could not believe it. It's, it's funny, but yeah. It's, the world we live in is an amazing place. Uh, it, it con continually amazed, truly. It's I, I tell people all the time, the world's a lot weirder than you think. Anything that you think is lame, just do the tiniest amount of research into it, and you'll be amazed by it. 
It's it's incredible. You're all right. The stuff that's out there. Yep, it's all made perfect, without a doubt. Yep. Yeah, I remember uh, like the first month or so of 2020. You know, before the real crazy hit, everyone was talking about those like fires in the Amazon and stuff like that. And we're going, and everyone's on social media going like, "Oh, boo hoo, we're burning the world's lungs." And I didn't say anything, but the whole town was thinking, "You don't really know where the world's lungs are, do you?" Yeah. <laughs> you would fail at planet-wide anatomy. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff happening all at the same time. It's uh, it's taken everything we've thrown at so far. We sure haven't been nice to it. That's that's uh, without a doubt. Well, that's yeah, but, but kind one of the, so, one it's of the so that, Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Nate. Uh, one of the funniest facts I like to share with people is the fact that there's actually more trees on the planet now than there were a hundred years ago. Yeah, true. Um, there's more there's more trees in the U.S. than there was a hundred years ago. Uh, but there's more in the in the world in general. There's more greenery, which is interesting. Um, but um, no, and it, this kind of cir somewhat circles back to the non-native thing. But um, I, I I talk I talk about this too because I I say whenever people ask me about the iguanas or the Burmese pythons and stuff like that down here, I always tell them I was like one thing you also have to realize: nature, mother nature, whatever you want to call it, is really good at taking like everyone always talks about the balance of it it's really good at taking on things and rebalancing itself and and i always tell them it's like that's another thing that you have to look at when you're looking at these invasive things like if you were to remove them that could unbalance it again it could rebalance with those things there and if you remove them it actually unbalances it you, like you think you're doing something good but it could actually cause more harm than, <laughs> than good and stuff i was like I was like the people that don't think the alligators are playing absolute heck on the the pythons down there are silly because they saw one picture of one uh, one alligator inside of a python's belly that exploded, which it really worked out yeah. really well for that python. Um, <laughs> they they gnaw on those things all the time. I mean, it's just like a daggum noodle. They have those all those noodles they want to eat all the time. Alligators are loving that stuff. It just you're right. It it's, it balances itself out. It, it it'll work it out. Yeah, I know exactly what photo you're talking about. It's the first time. I remember, remember my uh, old neighbor, in town neighbor, showed me that paper one time with that photo. And that's the first time I heard about pythons in the Everglades. And you know, being little seven to eight year old me, who was growing up watching a crocodile hunter, I was like, "Yes, this makes the Everglades even more awesome." Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, people always point to that picture. You know, I always say the same thing. How'd that python fare? How did he work? How did he work out in that situation? Yeah, he, sure, they're eating alligators all the time. Yeah, sure, they are. Sure, they are. Well, the USGS just came out with the first official footage of uh, bobcats preying on on Burmese python eggs, but it's that's something that's been rumored for a while that they've been doing. But that was the first time they've officially like seen it happen, which was pretty interesting. They but make I up sea turtles' nests on the beach. Yeah. Bobcats what I do. Thought, slick. They're slick. Yeah. What I thought was the super interesting part, and it goes to the slick part, I thought was super cool is that it, I don't know if you've seen the video or not, but it, it goes kind of somewhat entangles, messes with the mom that's sitting there. I think they said it was like a 200 or 250 pound python is what the, the USGS said. But then it, the, the bobcat leaves and waits for the mother to leave and then comes back and digs up the eggs and eat it. It's insane. It's so cool. Animals are so smart. Uh, I, I think it's, it would really spook people out if they knew how smart animals actually were. They, yeah. they know what's going on. They know a lot better what's going on than we do. For sure. Yeah. And, and cats, are, cats are a whole different level anyhow. I think sometimes they try to get themselves in bad situations just to see how they can work it out. <laughs> just to show off. Cats are yeah. <laughs> Wild much. cats are awesome. Domestic cats, eh, not so much. <laughs> I've seen th those goofy videos you see of cats whacking alligators at alligator farms because those are those are farm gators that are usually have that's happening to. I've seen that happen in the wild one time, um, and it's not uncommon. Whenever we would go on calls, uh, nuisance nuisance alligator calls, to go to a neighborhood, there'd be an alligator laying on somebody's front porch or in their driveway, and every neighborhood cat 
be hanging out with them like they're old buddies. It's the weirdest thing you ever seen. I don't know, understand what they're talking about or like they're old friends and they're all talking about, hey, I catch rats, you catch rats, we all catch rats. I don't know, but there's some kind of weird mix there between uh, between alligators, uh, crocodilians, and, and cats. I'm not sure what it is there. So maybe the, the bobcat got paid off. That's where I'm getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> they had something worked out later on, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Gator mob, yeah. The gators are kind of like the mob in the in the Everglades, and they're you know, bob, the, the bobcats are their muscle. There's some deeper plan there somewhere, I'm sure. Um, yeah. I don't know what it might be, but yeah, That's they're just looking up to they're up to figure it out. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, the so what what are your thoughts this is well off topic of gators but kind of on talk of topic of what we've been talking about but are do you are your thoughts on like the iguanas any different from like the burmese pythons because the iguanas are more they don't really cause much problems they're more of a nuisance to people they make a they make a terrible mess yeah i was gonna say that's usually more... that's usually the argument and they eat they might eat your hibiscus flowers that's right they're really bad they're really bad about that Again, they're here to stay. They yeah. have these. There's some. They're, I've been seeing these. I saw something on YouTube where there's a guy going out in people's neighborhoods with an air rifle and his dog and shooting, shooting iguanas. I don't know why in the world you would ever put something like that on YouTube or why people would think that was entertaining, or you know, they just wh why do it in the first place? I don't know. Again, the worst thing they're going to do is eat some of your flowers uh, and maybe poop on your pool deck. Um, they're <laughs> Same thing as a bird. They're, yeah, they're not going to eat your kids. You know, they're not going to eat your pets. They're. Uh, that's what I never. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. That's what I never understood about like the, how the FWC always encourages people to take your air rifle and shoot the iguanas. Like, what are they? What are they doing? Other than like, I know everyone because I work down in Marco Island. Everyone in Marco Island hates them because they they dig up around their seawall. But it's like. I think that's you're putting like, more people in danger than you are fixing problems in that point. But again, um, that's just my two cents. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong. That's just my two cents. That and I saw a lady uh, somewhere in Miami have a, a water, an Asian water monitor walk up to her back porch. And she was like terrified and stuff. I was like, man, I would have been the happiest I've ever <laughs> been in my entire life. And if I had an Asian water monitor, and it was huge too, just walk up to my back porch. Or just over the door, and be like, "Come in, come in, come in." <laughs> that is pretty neat. Yeah. I, again, I'm not the I'm not the iguana expert. I'm not the invasive species expert. I'm allowed to have an opinion. My opinion will probably very very much differ from most. But I just I think there's better things to worry about. I always say worry about taxes or terrorism or worry about something important. You know what I mean? If you're yeah. if you're worrying about a, a an iguana and your tree in your yard. You really don't have that many problems. So, to kind of circle back onto more on topic of gators and stuff, um, what <laughs> do you have a theory as to why they are so like well adapted for like? It's like just talk. I didn't like. I I've always known they were like really well adapted like predators and stuff. But just talking to so many people on this thing of like just internally like how your their endocrine system, their um immune system all this kind of stuff like how they're so well adapted to take on so much stuff and be able to survive they've been around for a long time for a reason i mean there is nothing better at survival than than them i mean i, I think it all breaks down to the way their brains built you know what i mean they it they are absolutely genius uh genius level animals i've seen them solve problems i've seen them seen them work through things and and really think about it their biggest downfall kind of becomes that smarts. Uh, their, their biggest downfall is us and their ability to see an easy way to take it, to take an easy way out of, on, of, on eating stuff and being fed. It only takes one or two times for them to watch you feeding the fish or feeding the turtles or throwing some bread to something. And they go, okay, um, that man, I don't got to work for a living anymore. I got this going for me. That is the only downfall they, that species has for them is literally their ability to take the easy way out. Uh, we, we would refer to them as a bum when they do that. Like they're just going and taking, taking the five bucks from you and going and buying a sandwich, never having to do anything for it. 
you know, it's nothing against homeless people by any means. I'm just saying that they'll take yeah. the they'll take the easy way. You know what I mean? Yeah. If they no, if I, they can find an easy way to do it, they'll do it. And that's really for them. They're conserving they're conserving energy. They're conserving body mass, uh, and they're doing things the smart way by doing that. So their their intelligence is their biggest downfall. It truly is. I the first time we ever came down to South Florida, I was with you know Nate and stuff, and we were fishing in this canal. It was like the first second day we were there, and I didn't realize I was fishing over my encyclid bed at the time, but <laughs> I quickly realized when every single time I casted, like I immediately catch immediately catch a my encyclid, and there's a gator that was in the bush right over there, and it probably has people fish there all the time, and probably knows people catch a lot find cichlids there and just toss them back and so sure enough as I'm, i keep pulling in these things he comes right up like just a few inches from me but he just sat there and just waited for me to toss these fish back and then he eat them and stuff had no yes. interest in me he knew like that i was going to be throwing the fish back and three meals <laughs> fishermen are a huge downfall to him for the same reason you said there too it's bycatch leaving things a lot around leaving bait left over whether that be shrimp or whatever it might be on the banks uh it's being sloppy, making a point when you catch the fish uh, to if you're putting them back in the same area and the fish is weak, that's the easy prey. Again, it's it's their intelligence. They're taking the easy way. Um, fishing is is a huge part of the issue with uh, friendly alligators, without a doubt. And some things need to be some things need to really be changed with that. But again, what can you change? I mean, I, I don't yeah. I don't know. I don't have the answers with that. I just know that is 100 percent one of the issues. That and anywhere you see a don't feed the alligator sign is where the alligators get fed from. <laughs> yeah, that's the reason that sign's there. Yeah, you put a you put a bench by a park, and you put uh, anywhere there's a bench in a park, alligators are getting fed from there. And anywhere there's a don't feed the alligator sign, that's where they're getting fed from. I guarantee it. Dolphins, experience experience says. Dolphins do the same exact thing. They will follow fishermen around, wait for you to tire out the fish, toss back, eat it. I've even seen a dolphin come steal a like a prize snook off someone's hook as he's reeling it in and then swim up to the boat with the snook in its mouth show and went and ran and swam up to every boat showing the snook in their mouth like ha 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 i stole your fish and then swim away and ate it like went around to every boat and showed that it caught the, it took the fish it's insane when i was like when i was a kid we had uh dolphins here in the indian river lagoon that had navy stamps on them they were stamp department of the Navy, uh, and these jokers, they would, they're just like you were saying, they'd want to, they come to your boat, they start doing flips and doing tricks, waiting for you to feed them fish. And of course, everybody fed them. Uh, they were, yeah. they were the same thing. They were pet, your pet trick dolphin that'd follow you around. Yeah. Pretty weird stuff. But again, another, another very slick off, slick, very slick animal. I had, no one believes me when I say this, <laughs> but I swear I was fishing. And I saw a dolphin do that little like flipper thing, like you see in TV shows. Like I even yeah. had like the first time I worked for the kayak thing that I do. Like the the guy said, like when dol you see the dolphins do that in shows, they don't do that in nature. That's only in shows. I told him afterwards, I was like, I swear, I saw it in nature. I saw I was fishing, and I look over and I see a dolphin do the little thing. It blew my mind because I thought I, I too thought they they didn't didn't in nature didn't do it in nature. I thought it was only a show thing that they did, but. These Navy mm -hmm. ones used to do that. You'd be go, you'd be on a plane going to the middle of the channel, and they'd be standing up watching you go by like a person. Yeah, <laughs> just stuff just like that. I mean, it was spooky. Like it was that. Hey, there was the there's the Navy dolphin. There he is. Yeah. They had a whole little crew of them. Yeah, pretty neat. Yeah. You, you never know what those guys have been through or what they've been around. You you don't know. It's you can yeah. never you can never say never with wildlife. You as soon as you do it, you're immediately wrong. You're immediately <laughs> gonna be you're gonna be, immediately be proven wrong without a doubt but I, I compare a lot uh alligators to the dolphins because they're both so intelligent but i like to compare the intelligence part but the fact that like dolphins are really easy like their behavior is really easy to interpret like the, what they want and stuff and kind of kind of what they're thinking which is pretty cool and gators are so much more subtle i feel like unless you like you spend like your entire life with them like they're there's they're a lot more subtle than like any any idiot that's never really dealt with dolphins a lot of times can understand what a dolphin's like thinking or doing but like a gator unless you've worked with them for a long time they're a lot harder to tell but they're both super intelligent animals so i i like to uh, so you, you, 
you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, but I'm pretty sure they have the same cerebral cortex, the dolphin and alligator. I, I'm, I'm pretty pretty certain. I could be wrong. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I'm not 100% sure either, but I yeah, think you're right. Uh, right. Crocodilians, I think, are the only extant group of reptiles to have a cerebral cortex. Yeah, I'm pretty sure them and the them and the uh, dolphins have the, pretty much the exact same brain setup. Yeah, and I my guess is to why, and this is just a theory, as to why their dolphins are a lot easier to interpret is because they're social, whereas, or more social than, than alligators. That's my guess. And yeah, so- one's, uh, One wants to be around people and, or it doesn't mind it as much. And the uh, other one, yeah, if he's around there, he's getting killed because he's around people. So right. yeah, why would he want to be? All right, yeah, exactly. So on that note, uh, what we say is you're a uh, crazy, craziest uh gator catch story i caught one last night in the jail that was pretty interesting uh, <laughs> in that's, the jail? That's, that, that's happened a couple times yeah that made it made it inside the fence of the jail yeah that's, that's happened a couple times but um weirdest one uh i got one i caught them out of people's houses i had one at like a nine and a half ten footer in a lady's house uh last year they called it into the, the police department as a four to five footer and she yeah. went out to take a smoke and it was just like three o'clock in the morning and left her door open. Her yard was flooded. This big gator walked in there. It her she was a hoarder, so it walked in her house and walked through the living room, through this little tunnel, down the hallway, into her bedroom, and up on top of her armoire. Literally it walked up things and got on top of this big dresser. And I walk in there and I said, Godzilla is in your house, and I have no idea how we're going to get out of here without emptying your entire house out. So we had literally had to take everything out of the house, make a path, go in there, catch the animal, and move them out. But um, I've caught them in the bottom of, miss the bottom of missile silos. Uh, I've caught them in the vehicle assembly building at NASA. I catch them on the, on the launch pads quite often. Uh, caught them underneath all the different – caught them underneath pretty, pretty much every rocket you can think of on the 45th Space Wing uh, or at NASA, underneath different atlases, underneath the shuttles. Yeah, all, all kinds of weird stuff. It's amazing. I've always wondered what goes through their mind, like when they find when they end up somewhere, like especially like in a house, for instance. Like, what made you go there? Because it's not always where you would expect them to necessarily go, based on what you know. Like, like from what we see over here, there, there's usually two reasons they're walking. Um, people always argue, well, it's mating season. They're moving because it's mating season. It's warm and they move, okay. But for the most part, over here where we're at, they're moving because they've lost a combat. Whoever loses walks, or they're walking for fresh water. They're walking for the smell of fresh water. Um, the rest of it's just people being silly. You know, it's, <laughs> I did an article for uh, USA Today a few weeks back. Uh, it's worth a Google. It said the the title of it says "Hot Hungry Alligators Roaming uh, Florida Neighborhoods." Literally, I threw out the entire article. I was preaching exactly what we're talking. They're they're not they're not walking around with murder on their mind. If they were, there'd be there'd be nobody left in Florida. Okay, right. they're move they're moving from one spot to the other. We have to understand they're the last thing they want to do is run across us as they're doing that. They don't want to have an interaction. If they get turned around, just give them a little bit. You know, give back off for a while. Don't stay twenty feet away. Back off forty yards. Watch what they're doing and and let them move on. It is. There's so many better things to worry about. They, uh, and yeah, they, they're the ultimate killing machine. If they really, if they wanted to kill people all day long, there would be nobody left. That's just yeah. not, just not them. Yeah, but uh, going back to that gator in the armoire, uh, <laughs> I didn't experience this first. I didn't experience this firsthand, but uh, the one, one of the gator parks I interned at in uh, East Texas, they do a lot of uh, nuisance gator removals. So that's where a lot of their gators come from, are uh, nuisances. Okay. That is one really big one. They call him Big Tex, and he was he's 13 foot, like eight and a half inches, something like that. So, you know, pretty big boy. Well, where their place is at, it's really low elevation, so whenever a hurricane comes through, it floods. So they wanted to get him out of the property, so they want to, like, escape when the whole property is underwater. So they, they had these uh, trailers, and they had this one trailer that was, like, back half was cargo, the front half had, like, a a small bedroom in it, you know, like queen, queen size bed. They put in the back half of that, took up to one of the owner's houses because it was higher elevation. He comes out the next day to check on him. He looks in the back, doesn't see him in there, but he sees 
the door to the bedroom's busted open. So he walks up, peeks inside the, the bed, peeks inside the bedroom, and there's this 13-foot alligator just laying there, there on top of that queen-size bed. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you a picture after the show of it. It's, that sounds pretty crazy. Yeah. yeah. So that place you worked at was that is that Brian Henley's place? No. It's, you, uh, do you, do you know Do you know Brian Henley? Uh, he's he's at a he's at an alligator. He him and his I think it's his family runs an alligator place there in Texas somewhere. Uh, no, it's a place called uh, Gator Country. Oh, okay, I got you. But, um, um, where where that's at is like very far east in the East Texas. It's like okay, uh, outside, just outside of uh, Beaumont. Basically. I got you. Okay, I think he's somewhere on the border, somewhere down there closer to the border. Yeah, yeah, that'd be a, considering it's Texas, that's a pretty far ways away. Yeah, that's, that's a very large place. <laughs> very um, large place. No, but I, I find it interesting, like, sometimes I'll take out, like, my lizards and stuff and let them just, like, in kind of a controlled environment, but just kind of, like, let them explore in, like, my living room and stuff. And it, it's funny because, I mean, obviously they immediately kind of, like, you know, get their bearings kind of like you can tell them kind of figuring out what's what's where am I at? What's going on? You know, they're licking, they're exploring and stuff or they're smelling, flicking their tongue out. And um, it's funny, though, because you always like I'll expect them to go somewhere. I'd be like, OK, they're going to go. They're next to the couch. They're going to they're gonna try and go under the couch because it's, it's small, dark, warm, you know, and stuff. And they'll let go somewhere else, like somewhere you wouldn't expect. And you kind of and you you'll grab and like turn them around. And they'll immediately go back there, and you kind of turn them around. You'll even move them farther away, and you'll like immediately. It's it's so I, I've always I don't know. That's something I've always wanted to just, uh, be able to understand what they're thinking. Like, what are they seeing and understanding that I'm not? You know, like when I did Copperhead research, I saw a Copperhead. We the whole what part of the thing was studying why they're eating cicadas, and I saw one slither right up to a cicada smell it and stuff like its tongue out and then just slither away right away and then it went native cicada later like there's something about it that it could see that we couldn't understand it's so cool yep it's pretty neat stuff like i was saying every time we think we know what's going on we realize we don't know what's going on yeah it's, it's, that's i think that's why i'm more of a lizard guy is i feel like i can like gators are like i like I feel like I can see a lizard thinking more. Like than crocodiles are pretty good to it. Like seeing and understanding that they're thinking. Um, but I don't know. For lizards are my favorite, and I just I just like seeing them. Like trying to figure out what they're doing, and like seeing them thinking and, and figuring out what's going on and stuff. It's so cool. Alligators 100% think about things. Yeah, 100%. Uh, yeah, I, that's one of my things is watching them and understanding what they're thinking and why they're thinking it 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 yeah it's a beautiful thing it's it's all what you're good at you know what i mean we all have our uh, our blessings and our things and that's what makes us all special yeah what makes them special too really right yeah exactly do you so, get go ahead. so you mentioned uh you do work with uh, the iucn uh, crocodilian board you want to talk about uh what you do with them at all or uh, yeah, so I've been on that board. Um, I think the last CSG meeting I made was Argentina in 2018. Um, yeah, I've been on the Human Crocodile Conflict Board for them. Uh, it's run by a fellow named Simon Simon Poole. Uh, yeah, we kind of just try to put together different plans. Uh, recently wrote up a kind of nation worldwide set of uh, standards for capture, transport, and uh, release of, of crocodilians, stuff like that. Uh, just some, some simple stuff. Do you, um, so obviously you get, like, you'll get, like, calls of when a gator's in someone's house. But do you get a lot of calls of people, like, there's a gator in my canal, can you remove it? Uh, like, yeah, when I, yeah. When I was doing the, when I was doing the work, yeah, that's a, a big portion of it. Um, unfortunately, is people seeing an animal and not knowing what to be afraid of or what to worry about or what not to worry about, and they put that on the person going out there. They put that on the trapper to go out there and not necessarily talk to that person, but explain to them what to be worried about or what not to be worried about. 
I'm not doing the work anymore. Um, mm. But the you know that's the state's really changed its uh, its idea about all that. You know, when I first started doing it back in the day with my uncle, part of it was going there and speaking to the person and giving them the conservation talk of why they should have that animal there. And that's went, you know, due to liability causes, it's went a lot different here recently. It's uh, they're, they're, it was kind of flip flopped. Mm. Interesting. That's yeah, kind of um, kind of beyond me to talk about that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Did um, what are your thoughts on the um, using economic incentives to help conserve animals? Like kind of similar to what we did with the alligators and stuff. So that's kind of Economic incentives, for instance, uh, give me a give me a for instance. Like, so I was um, I was told the alligator was the first animal to be put on the endangered species list, first one to take off, and part of that was because the hunters would uh, they started to um, basically farm them. Fifty percent go in the wild. Fifty percent get kept for meat and skin. You can create an a incentive to keep an animal they get to care about it more than if you're just we should save this animal and so the idea is if you can get industry working for it it conserves them faster and better um uh yeah the, so they're they're having successful uh a lot of success with that down in argentina with uh uh the 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 jacare institute i believe it's called uh they're doing something like that. They're actually paying people to go out and collect nests and bring them the nests to different caiman species. Uh, there's, it's pretty in depth. It might be, it might be a conversation worth having with those guys. They, uh, sure? they do something very much like that. There's anytime you can bring the local population or the local group into, uh, into your conservation plan and get them not necessarily excited about that, but find a way to make it like you're saying, worthwhile for them to be part of it um, I, just, I don't it, you got to figure out where you're getting that money from obviously but uh, if you yeah. can do that it makes a big difference yes mm -hmm. I'm yeah, sure I, it depends I'm sure it depends on the species and what you're dealing with but um, yeah. I know that's been that's a kind of an idea they've been using down there in Argentina it's been working for them that's cool yeah I yeah I don't know I, I've heard I don't know I've heard a lot of people in support of it but I'm also people, people, people um, um, they aren't a huge fan of it, fan. Um, but none of them really have ever explained to me why, so I wasn't sure. But it sounds like a good idea to me, at least. Marissa would be the one to talk to you about that, seeing as she's the uh, sitting CSG chair for pretty much uh, the entire, what, the entire, uh, entire uh, South America down there in the we, Caribbean. We kind of touched on the subject. We talked about how, you know, getting the people involved, because you, you can't, like, say okay you have to give up all these things in order to concern you know like you have to work with the people and stuff but we didn't necessarily specifically talk about economic incentives so yeah that'd be interesting yeah it's not anything they've really done done here per se i mean yeah. kind of sort of but not really i heard i don't know if any of this is true i heard that they were do using economic incentives to help the tigers in india but then they made it illegal, and then the numbers started. Their numbers started to tank again. So I don't know if any of that's true, but I heard that somewhere. I don't know. Yeah, it would it would make sense. Yeah, money money is usually the answer for about everything, isn't it? Yeah, if you get yeah. someone to someone makes money off of it, then they start caring about it. <laughs> You're right. That's the way it works. Yep. Uh. Well, Matt, do you have any other questions? Um, no, I think um, I think that's it for me. Uh, it was great chatting with you guys. Yeah, it was, it was a good pleasure. chat. Yeah, it was some, uh, we covered some pretty cool stuff. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, uh, thank you for coming on. It was an honor, guys. Really, thank you all for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm.